How are public libraries evolving and innovating to best serve us and our community in the digital age? That's what we're discussing on this episode of Nevada Week. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt, Cashman Equipment, DeCastro Verde Law Group, Nevada State Bank, Valley Electric Association, and additional supporting sponsors. Welcome and thank you for joining us this week on Nevada Week. Well, the advance of technology and its expanding digital and mobile universe has drastically changed our way of life. It's most definitely changed how we access and use information, and in a traditional sense, how we've used libraries for that purpose. As progress marches on, how are public libraries able to reinvent themselves so that they are still providing a vital resource for our community? And how about you, the users? As your specific needs continue to evolve, for example, what mix of new and traditional roles can libraries serve in our current world of information overload and fake news? Or how can libraries innovate and help fill some of our larger state gaps we see in things like healthcare, or workforce, or earlier education? Well, we have a great panel for you today to help us answer these questions. Please welcome Matt McNally, Community Engagement Director for the Las Vegas Clark County Library District. Jaime Cruz, Executive Director of Workforce Connections. Jeff Scott, Director of the Washoe County Library System, and Garrett Decay, Branch Manager and Librarian at the Alexander Library in North Las Vegas. Thank you so much for being here, all of you. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Great, thanks well, for having us. I want to start, uh, Matt, actually, why libraries? Why, why are libraries still a very relevant resource in our community? Well, yeah, that's a very great question. I mean, starting out, I mean, with the advent of, you know, the the development of Google and Amazon and just information being so much more readily accessible, that's a question that we get all the time, right? And, and I think there's a couple answers um, to that question. The first being is that libraries are already part of the local community. We are the third place, right, where people want to come and convene and it's a place that where they can receive trusted, unbiased information. And I think that's what leads to our public trust um, you know, with our community. So um, another part of that is that we are really an extension of the educational system. Um, you know, we support Clark County School District and charter schools and, um, and other forms of universities and learning um, throughout um, you know, our, our service areas. Um, and then I think the, really the last part about that uh, to, to answer that question is, we are really connected into all different sectors of the community, like you said, whether it be healthcare or workforce development. And so um, through partnerships that we uh, establish with other community members, we can do really great things um, for our local communities. And Jeff, let's talk a little bit about what the, the state of, of public libraries are then. And let's just look over the last 20 years to, to present. How have, we, how have we changed? And let's just talk about scope. I mean, when we're talking about users and uh, numbers and percentages of our populations and things like that. What kind of changes have we seen in libraries over the last 20 years? Well, what's really interesting is last year, Nevadans checked out over 18 million items from their local public libraries. And that's double from what it was 20 years ago. You have 83 public libraries serving all of Nevadans, and that's up from a 23 from 1999. So you see libraries are expanding. You're seeing people increasing the usage of libraries. And it's interesting how the different permutations have happened over the years. And now libraries have adapted to this change. So in 1990s, you would have asked, why do you need libraries anymore? The internet. Um, computers and libraries started in the early 90s, and it was just to access the library's reference collection. So you'd use a library and use a CD-ROM, and you'd pop it in there, and you'd use information that way. And then eventually, the library, the computers became a service in and of itself. You can access the internet, access the World Wide Web. Uh, a few years later, then you had the rise of e-books. I was like, well, with all the ebooks online, what did libraries roll? And I was like, libraries have free ebooks. You know, when you get that e reader, you get your iPad, you're downloading free ebooks from Project Gutenberg, and that's great. But once you're done with the County Monte Cristo, you want to probably read something a little more recent. And so public libraries have a service with Overdrive. Um, so if you go into your phone and you download the Overdrive app uh, or Libby, and you can download ebooks and downloadable audiobooks to your phone. So as you're commuting to work, you make it a little more enjoy enjoyable by listening to an audiobook. So we're constantly evolving. And the great thing about libraries is they're always asking, you know, what's the relevancy? What are we doing? Because we're always asking that question, what should we be doing next? And as Matt said, 
we're always really embedded in the community. We do strategic plans. We try to find out what is the what is the vision for the community. What do they want to see themselves in five years if they're a utopia? And so a library tries to to realize that vision by making changes, adjusting to what the community wants to see. And let's let's talk a little bit more about what what changes we've seen. And just with with demographics and things like that, are you seeing a difference in in income level or um, racial ethnicity backgrounds or anything like that? that are showing trends that are different than we were, say, 20 years ago on, on who is actually using the library. Well, I think it's always about how the population changed. So as the Nevadans, different kind of Nevadans come in and that uh, diversity changes and libraries are emerging with that, right with that. So Washoe County is very interesting because, you know, we serve uh, an urban core, we serve a suburban core, we serve a rural core. So we have different people in all those different populations. So when we recently did a strategic plan, it was sort of this tale of two cities. So you have this urban core that um, is isolated, sometimes linguistically isolated. So what can we do to help that population? They need basic services. So the, the best thing a library can do is have open hours, have a good collection. Um, that's always the, you know, no matter what you do and what a technology you put in there, it's open hours and having a good collection because that does far more than anything else. When you look at more of the suburban population, it's a little more affluent, they have more demands on services. So they're asking for things like streaming services, uh, services like Canopy where you can watch um, documentaries online through the library or Freegal where you can download music. Um, one of the more interesting things we're seeing lately is the rise of STEAM education. So again, libraries ask the community what's going on, what are the needs, and the big rise in STEM and STEAM education. So now you're seeing more maker spaces in libraries. Vegas Clark County has a wonderful different maker spaces that they have in all their libraries. Washoe County has the quad. And Jeff, can you explain what a maker's library is? It's basically looking at uh, STEAM and STEM education. So science, technology, engineering, math. And then we add Steam, so that adds the art component. Mm -hmm. So that always goes back to um, you know Apple products and 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 Leonardo da Vinci. So you have the, the merging of science and art becoming a beautiful piece of technology. Yep. And so uh, trying to teach people that these kinds of skills because the future you know you're going to need more the science pieces, the engineering pieces, the technology, the mathematics. And if kids don't get that early enough, then you know they're not going to be able to compete uh, in the in the tomorrow's workforce. Matt, Jeff's talking about strategic planning. Let's talk a little bit about the Las Vegas Clark County Library District itself. Uh, when we're talking about this evolution and how things have changed, where what what are some of the what are some of the main strategies that it, the district is employing to kind of be in this new era of libraries? Yeah, well, to add to a lot of those comments, I mean, what we're seeing is that our business model has to evolve, and we are moving away from the transactional world, right, to the experiential world, and that's what I meant by libraries being really the, the third place, right? You have home, you have work, and libraries can be that third place that you go to for. Um, the, uh, the connection that people are looking for, right? And whether that be through uh, maybe a, taking in uh, something at one of our performing arts centers, like a, a music performance or ballet, or uh, you know, uh, a theater production, or whether it's attending one of our 13 art galleries, or coming to the library to learn a new language, or um, you know, to uh, really immerse yourself in all of the different types of services that, that libraries offer. It's not, uh, it, books will be our, our core business, right? It, we, we are in the business of providing information, right? Um, but what we're seeing is that transformation of people also wanting this experiential component of where, to, where do I bring my son or daughter to get the story time uh, where they can participate in, but the, the family can also learn those educational roles of a parent at home. And Gary, let's talk about the individual branch then. What are you seeing at, at that individual level of how users are using your particular library? So in, in my particular branch, I, I see a lot of, well, there's online users, so they're, access, they're downloading books, they're using um, the, the Libby app to download books to their devices. Um, there's, they're also accessing the databases that we, we have. They're using the um, BrainFuse to, to get live tutors 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they're also using a transparent language databases to, to learn English in, in a lot of cases. Um, and Garrett, the, the online uh, tutoring service here, is, it, is that a virtual tutoring service where there's, there's tutors that are actually it tutoring is. you from other areas? Yes. So the, the basically, our, our patrons are, are connecting with tutors, live tutors. They can connect online in a chat room environment. And basically, they, they could upload their papers. They can get their papers reviewed. They can um, download uh, math problems. 
and get help with solving those those math equations. So let's talk more about collective services on the adult population. And I know one of the things that has happened locally is is um, working really with workforce. And, and Jaime, I want to talk to you a little bit about the One Stop Center as a shining example of what we've been able to do with libraries. First off, what is a what is a One Stop Center? Great question. The federal government sends down uh, millions of dollars across the nation for employment and training to keep America competitive and move people who don't have jobs uh, into having jobs and people who perhaps have entry level jobs to better paying jobs. So all these multiple funding streams come together in a one stop. So come get everything done in one stop. And so these are also sometimes referred as American job centers. And so bringing these services, these multitude of employment and training services into one location, what better place than the library for all the reasons that we've heard before. And Matt, I, let's talk a little bit about this partnership. Exactly what is the library di district doing in something um, re related to workforce connections? Are you just providing the space or are you way more involved in the process? Well, we're much more involved in the process. And um, you know, our, our partnership with Workforce Connections is probably our, our most strategic partnership that we probably have as a library district. We value and realize and recognize the importance of uh, you know, really growing that partnership for the community. So what the library's role in that on the employment side um, is or to help provide the space for them to execute the services and, and help people get employed and, and, and receive how those higher wages that Jaime was talking about. Um, what we're also doing on our side is uh, for uh, nearly 20 years, we've been receiving some of that funding for the educational component of adult basic education, for to assist English language learners, to help with math proficiency, um, to help with computer classes and really prepare the future of the workforce, right? So not everyone goes through a traditional pathway of education of completing a high school diploma and then maybe going on to an associate or bachelor or master's degree. Some people are looking for certification. Some people need specific on the job trainings that we can help prepare them for. So with our partnership, really what we're trying to do is help those individuals in the community get the education that they need at the library and then move them through a pipeline to employment uh, through Workforce Connections. Uh, Garrett, this brings up the question, a librarian needs to know a lot more than just being what a traditional librarian is. And we're talking about a lot of these, lot of these services that are there. How are librarians being cross-trained at your particular branch to be able to uh, manage all these services? Right, so the, in, in my particular branch, we're, we're a really small district, so the librarians and the library staff, they, they need to be able to wear different hats. So we, we em basically empower everyone from from the top all the way down to even the security guard. The, the, our security guard knows what our mission is. They know the services that One Stop provides. And we, we, we want everyone to, to know what's available and how we can best help people. And then Jaime, how are, how are One Stop staff then working with librarians and making sure that both are being cross-trained on, on how the whole process works for something like workforce development? Yeah, and that's the secret sauce, right? When you, uh, when I remember when we first um, dreamt up this partnership, our first partner was the Las Vegas Clark County Library District, and one of the first impressions I got walking into a library, and uh, I have to admit I hadn't been there in many years since my kids had grown up, uh, but. I found out that their clients just looked just like our clients. They were people, again, looking for information, looking for how to better their careers, looking for where jobs opportunities were, and looking where training opportunities were. So uh, it, the, the cross-pollination and the cross-training has been an organic function, if you will. We see it getting better and better every day. And as Garrett explained, I think that's the secret of the success so far. We already see um, indicators, if you will, that the work happening at the one stops within the libraries is just as good as the work happening in the other existing one stops. If I could jump in too, maybe just yeah, add um, to like what Jaime is saying. I think when people come into a library and they are looking for that information or that educational training, right, um, sometimes they come in, they just know that they need a job, right? And um, where Jaime's experience and expertise is with Workforce Connections and the service that they provide is that through those 17 different titles of federal funding to help get people employed, they don't know specifically which title of service that they're going to qualify for, right? They just know they need a job. So you can come to a, your local library, which is in your local community, total free of charge, right? And you can get these types of services. And that's what's important is that you don't have to know exactly what type of service you qualify for. You can show up at a one-stop career center and someone somewhere will be able to help you with the funding that's provided.
And so, so Je Jeff and, and Matt both, I, I'm wondering how how are you coming to the decision that a one stop is something that should be in some of your library branches? Are you using data? Are you using who is actually using your library? Are you looking more at who's not using your library to kind of make decisions like that? Well, I mean, you could see that in a reference transaction. So we have public access computers in all of our libraries. And so you have people coming in and they come up and they ask for help. I need to set up an email account. Why do you need to set up an email account? Why well, I need to apply for this job? And I need an email account to apply for this job. So then you're going through this whole process of, you know, someone who doesn't know, know how to use an email or get an email account, setting that up for them. And then the next step is writing out a resume. How do I write a resume? How do I put that in Word? What should it say? What should it look like? I have no idea. And then doing all this online. A lot of people will have trouble transitioning from a paper resume to an electronic resume mm -hmm. because they're using the computer as another skill set they may not have had. So then we're starting to see that every day growing and growing and like, wow, you know, they do this all the time. Mm -hmm. Let's partner together so then we have more expertise coming in. Um, if you go into a lot of the one stops or even the job centers on their own, you'll see very similarities. There's people sitting at computers applying for jobs. You'll see that at libraries sitting at computers applying for jobs. It makes sense to combine that together because then you have the combined expertise to help this population. Right. And Jeff, let's talk a little bit about uh, traditional roles of what libraries are, right? I, I mentioned in my intro, right, fake news. Uh, we're inundated with information from everywhere now. It's kind of like drinking through a fire hose, really. Uh, how has that changed how a library is really providing a reference or a resource for how to get the right information, how to get real news, so to speak, and real, real information? We've always had computer classes in our libraries, and so a lot of times you're teaching really basic information searching. So you might be, you know, here's an introduction to a computer, introduction to a mouse, introduction to Word, and then the World Wide Web. And so learning how to get information, so where does this, what is the source, is this the trusted source? And that's something we've done for a long time, and this has just only increased. We recently with fake news. So you know how many times I get information where I saw this online, they sent it to you and it's a YouTube link. And it's like, well that's great, that's on YouTube, but where's the facts? Where's the information? Where is this coming from? And I think YouTube's been the really big uh, prolificator of just this false information because I can set up a YouTube channel tomorrow, go on there and then say, all kinds of stuff, and then how do you verify it's true or not? It's just one person saying it. And so we're, we have extra task now to get kind of combat that kind of information. So it's kind of funny because the, the CEO of YouTube said that YouTube was like a library, uh, mm -hmm. which is really hilarious because it's like we don't let anyone off the street come in and write a book and just stick it on the shelves. <laughs> you know, we actually vet this information. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, we want this book. Well, what's a balanced collection? So you have something that's liberal or something that's conservative. Here's the balanced information about it. And that's what yeah. we're really we're, we're core to do is finding that balance. You want information on this, we'll find any information that you want and give you a balanced source from it. Yeah. Now let's talk about the future and let's let's talk more out of the box thinking. When, when we're being as risky as we can on what we can do in the future, what are some of the ideas that Library District has of really reinventing where libraries are going to be in the next 20 years? Yeah, that's um, a really interesting process that we're grappling with right now. In fact, um, our executive council just led uh, a master facility plan that was recently approved by our board of trustees to really talk about the next 10 to 15 years and and how do we um, reinvent our spaces to serve the needs of the future? How do we financially prepare, uh, you know, for that uh, transfer, transfer uh, formative change? And then how do we prioritize it? Right, because uh, we're a system of 25 libraries and we can't do every single branch at once and we can't do um, every type of new project um, at once. So um, we just went through this uh, giant master facility plan that took into account the needs of our staff, the, ne the demographic needs of the community, um, along with what future services uh, that we want to provide. So uh, coming up here actually, uh, April 25th, we have a grand opening of our new East Las Vegas library. And this is going to be the flagship model of service that you're going to start to see over the next 10 to 15 years inside this library at 28th and Bonanza. For, yeah. for the, the average user goes in the library, what are they gonna see that's different in that so library? So when you walk into that library, the first thing that you're gonna see is this great interactive kiosk that's gonna tell you about all the activities and programs that are happening throughout the day. It's gonna give you lots of different information on resources that are available for you to kind of pursue throughout the library. Um, once you step beyond that, that's when we start getting into different services that are provided. So there will be a TV production recording studio with a green screen and computers for software editing, places for uh, uh, teens and, and adults to do um, either blogging or their podcasts and uh, uh, working with special software programs for video and audio, uh, audio editing. It has a uh, community meeting room that uh, can serve up to 300 individuals that has a, a demonstration kitchen for the culinary arts. Uh, it has conference rooms and study spaces. It has tutoring. 
uh, has a story time room for uh, for kids and parents to participate in during the day. So it is really going to be that flagship model that creates those experiences that we want individuals to have when they come into a library. Jeff, how about how about up in Washoe? What do we have uh, planned for the next 20 years? Well, right now we're we're renovating our downtown Reno library. We're planning to to renovate downtown Reno library, Sparks Library, and then the um, Northwest Library. And so the idea behind that is trying to shift the library to meet the community needs. So when we did a strategic plan, one of the things we, we discovered was less than half of Washington County children can read at grade level. And so we're talking about a lot of the things in the future and how libraries are changing. There's still core things that we're still doing. And so we're trying to get um, children reading at grade level, getting them school ready. So we're expanding all of our children's area and all of our libraries. So we did this recently at the North Valley's library, larger children's area, uh, children's usage increased 20%. Same thing at downtown Reno Library. Downtown Reno Library is huge, 60,000 square feet, but it was built in 1966. So it's really interesting trying to um, make that library change into the future. But at the same time, there was some vision in that. So we have these spaces to create these kinds of environment. We just developed the quad which is a maker space on the fourth floor of the downtown Reno Library. So you can come in and do anything from leather making, 3D printing, virtual reality, all there. Recently, we, we live streamed the local TEDx UNR at the library because we have a large auditorium at seats 104. Renovate it to have state-of-the-art equipment to film that. So it's just moving with that community need. In 20 years, you're still going to be having the same conversation. And it's always interesting. You probably could have filmed this 20 years ago and had the same conversation about mm. what libraries are doing. As long as we're <laughs> merging with the population and asking them that question, what should we should be doing, you'll always have a library there serving you. Yeah. For, for us, the development of partnerships is crucial to the next, I think, 10 to 20 years, right? Yeah. Uh, building partnerships with nonprofit organizations and government in, uh, entities and having great partners like Workforce Connections and the One Stop Career Center, which will also be part of this new library, are critical to the success of our industry. Yeah, and, uh, and, they're, they're the leaders. And, and Jaime, I wanted to ask you too, because you're such an engaged partner, what are you seeing in the library system? Where are some of the gaps you're seeing that you think could be filled by other community partners working with libraries? in the future. Let me tell you first uh, why we want to continue to work with the libraries, right? Because uh, as I said, the original partnership with the Las Vegas Clark County Library uh, ended up in a partnership with the North Las Vegas Library District and one with the Henderson Public Libraries and one with the Boulder City Library District. So four library districts in this Las Vegas Valley has meant that just a month ago we celebrated uh, 1,000 people have been enrolled in, the, in these one-stop centers within these libraries. And these 1,000 people are now improving their careers, getting jobs. And so that's the reason why we want to do more. And when you say, uh, what is it that you want to do more? I think exactly everything we've heard today the world is going to change. Uh, the the workplace is going to change. The the fact that we have artificial intelligence already on the Las Vegas Strip, mixing drinks, delivering things to the rooms, means that we have to uh, really be mindful about what the workforce looks like tomorrow. And so I think that's something we'd like to explore, as you heard today, with the education system, the library, uh, about what that means and how the one stops that that we uh, that we sponsor can play a role in that development. One of the things that uh, one-stop centers do is, is provide more system navigation to social services, healthcare, childcare, things like that. I, I'm wondering, are those things that we can, might be able to see in libraries in the future? We might have you know, healthcare or, or potentially you know, childcare, early education type of programs, things like that. Yeah, already we work with Southern Nevada Health District and their immunization uh, uh, vehicle, their outreach vehicle comes to local libraries to provide that type of service. Uh, we work with Three Square where we give produce giveaways to uh, help with nutritional uh, meals for youth uh, during the summertime and, and for, for our local communities. And so we probably work with about 350 different partners throughout the community to help provide their services in local communities through libraries. And, and really in the next 10 to 15 years, I really see that just really growing and expanding and uh, helping us, uh, helping all organizations across the, uh, the valley here with, uh, you know, just their, their footprint in our community. And Garrett, this might be our, this might be our final question, but let, let's, let's talk uh, about the viewers that are watching right now and might be engaged and want to be more engaged in libraries. Let's talk about your particular branch specifically. What, what, would, what would you recommend to them? How would you encourage them to come to the library? And what do you have as the resources that they can, they can get at your library? There's tons of resources in the library. And one of the big, one of the most big, uh, big impacts that we've had having one stop in our building, we've literally taken a person, his name is uh, Chuck. This person was living in a tent and he was looking for a job. He didn't know, he had nowhere else to go, so he would come to the library daily. He would access the, uh, the Wi-Fi using his phone, looking for jobs. So 
in, in his visits to the library, he found out that one stop was in the building. So he registered with the, the Nevada Job Connect and he was able to get in the system. He found the additional services that were available. So he was able to get a bus pass to go to his interview, job interview. He was able to get um, resources from the welfare services to be able to help pay for his rent. And now he's working at a sporting goods store and he's, he's a perfect example of. I can't think of a, a, a better example and a better way to end our, end our show. Thank you so much for all being here. We really, really appreciate it. And thank you, as always, for joining our discussion on Nevada Week. And this discussion will continue on our Nevada Week extras. Visit our website at vegaspbs.org, Nevada Week, to watch this continuing conversation, to view previous episodes, or to access resources discussed on the show. Also, if you have a topic or issue you'd like us to explore on Nevada Week, we would love to hear from you. Please find us on social media or email us at nevadaweek at vegaspbs.org. Thank you again, and I'll see you on the next Nevada Week.